Right, good evening. What time is it? Good evening, everyone. Sorry, time zone. Hi! <laughs> Sorry, I'm so, the time zones are so mixed up and stuff. Um, I have a very dear friend to me. Um, some of you may know her. She's called Cass. And um, whenever I travel, I have a habit of, whenever each of us travel, we have a habit of checking in on the other person when they wake up, whoever's home. So it's almost time for me to check her, up on her. Anyway, that's not the point. So my name is Simeon Oriko. I come from Nairobi, uh, Kenya. I've been purely born and bred in Nairobi. And uh, I'm going to take you through a story. I, I realize it's evening. Um, a lot of our heads are pumping with all sorts of different information. And I figured maybe a good story would help us all unwind. In 2007, I went to college. It's in a town called Eldoret, six hours drive from Nairobi. And it's a very green, quiet place. Now, from the main junction, uh, from the main road to the school where I used to go to, um, it's about a nine kilometer drive. Now, the interesting thing, the only two things that you see on that nine kilometer drive, um, you'll either see lots of tea, you might know Kenya as being famous for exporting tea. And you will also see very, very, very many secondary schools. A lot of how the culture in Kenya works is that a lot of people value education more than anything. Um, well, I think mobile phones are beating education because I've heard stories of people forgoing meals just to save up to buy the latest mobile phone. So what people do is that people come together as families, as neighborhoods, and they decide that our, our neighborhood needs a school, and they put up one. So on this nine kilometer stretch, there's a total of 27 different schools. There may be more right now, I don't know, but there's now 27 secondary and primary schools. The secondary schools alone are 13. So in uh, college, I got elected as a chairperson of the computer science club, and we were looking for activities to do as student activities are for the computer students. And I remembered the number of schools that were around and I figured and I asked, how many of these schools have a basic training in digital literacy? And so we did a spot check, turns out none. None of the 13 secondary schools at the time had any form of digital literacy training, no computers, nothing. And I thought, how about we take our laptops and let's just go on a Friday afternoon and just show them that this is Google, this is Twitter, this is mail, and this is how all these things works. And, and let's see what they say. And that's exactly what we did. Um, it turns out the program became really popular. It still runs to date. And we used to call them digital literacy camps. And these have been run in a number of schools, uh, not just in and around Eldoret, where I used to go to school, but in Nairobi, in Uganda, in Senegal. Um, and it formed the basis of what I want to specifically talk about this, this morning, this evening, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm in Kenyan time. <laughs> um, this evening. I finished school and I, I, so for those of you guys who are interested in statistics, only 2% of high school students graduate with any training in uh, computers, whether it's programming or basic digital literacy only 2% in the whole nation. Um, we've got about 700,000 graduates every year. Um, a new batch of people is about to graduate in early November. Only 2% of those have any computer literacy skills. So I moved back to Nairobi and uh, I met a friend and we dated for a while. And she sort of liked the idea of going to high schools and teaching people basic digital literacy. And so we went and uh, we started teaching digital literacy in the high schools in Nairobi. And this was a lot of fun, actually. It, 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 was, it was really cool to go to a school um, after school, this is between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., and meet with just the computer students, the computer class students, um, groups of about maximum of 50. And for two hours or an hour and a half every single day, just sit down and talk to them about computers and what they can do and how they can apply them in their lives and in their education. So 
I remember leaving a school once and Jane Park was in town. Is Jane here? All right, no, cool. Um, so we were leaving a school um, and Jane Park was in town and um, our regional coordinator, Alex, had set up a meeting between us and Jane Park. And uh, we, my, my, my friend told me that she, she was feeling frustrated and she didn't know why. Um, and just talking through it, she felt like we were concentrating our efforts in places where there are, the people there have privilege. They have 3G, um, 4G now. Um, they've got computers, they're, they're blessed, but that's not the situation across the country. There's still many, many, many people out there in the country who do not have access to all these tools that they can use. Um, and I made a promise and I told her we'll look into it. I, I, I just said it just so I didn't want to have to think about it that time. Um, and so we went off and we met Jane Park. And Jane, over a conversation, over coffee, we started talking about the programs we run in school. And she's like, oh, have you seen the School of Open? And I'm like, uh, well, Alex has told us about, Alex is the regional coordinator, he's told us about Creative Commons and stuff. Uh, and at, by that point, we had started um, using Creative Commons to license our curriculums and share them with other people. And, but we never really took that much of an interest in the School of Open. And so Jane introduced us to it. And so for those of you guys who don't know, the School of Open is a community, first of all, and that's how I'd like to describe it, um, of people, of peer educators. Um, I believe that every single person has a bit of knowledge that they can teach somebody else. And this is why the School of Open appealed to me, because it was groups of people who had knowledge and who wanted to teach it and share it with other people. So anybody with a course would come onto the platform, um, peer-to-peer -peer university, um, organize a course with other people and teach it, uh, mostly online. And that was fun while we did it. So what we did is we found a bunch of existing courses. My favorite one at the time was um, Become CC Savvy. Um, and it's a literal, you can finish the entire course in 30 minutes or less. Um, and we started incorporating those those lessons in our training programs. So we'd go to schools, we'd pick out um, lessons of or courses that people had taught online, and we'd sort of model them and translate them offline. So for quite some time, these became super popular in schools, in the high schools that we were teaching in. Um, and a lot of the students increasingly be began going online and exploring um, all the education resources, not just on peer-to-peer -peer university, but in all sorts of different places. And they started picking out what they could teach offline or what they could learn offline, and that's what they went with. The reason why this was happening is because most of you would not know this, is that uh, technology in most boarding schools in uh, Kenya is restricted. Most students get access, the average student um, in an urban area gets access to internet access in the computer for a maximum of two hours every week. Um, in the rural areas, it's probably half an hour or much, much less, close to zero. And, and so they began downloading and saving web pages um, and they had very interesting tricks. Some people even had, um, some people would take out, so some of them have phones illegally in school and they take screenshots of all the knowledge that they had. Some people would print them out and they would use that to study. And when we realized this, we're like, so there's an opportunity here. Why not just teach the courses directly? And this gave birth to what we initially called the School of Open Kenya, where the goal was to give people um, acts offline, teach people offline material, um, materials that would find offline, online, but teach them offline. And we had to model these materials and you know sort of rebuild them almost um, in such a way that they would be relevant to these people. So it turns out um, School of Open Kenya was a big success um, and a lot of other people uh, became interested in the School of Open and uh, those people are in this room and this is what gave birth to some of you might have heard the School of Open Africa project. So the School of Open Africa was like let's take this you know online thing and let's move it offline and let's see what happens. So Kelsey who's right there um, ran a Creative Commons for Kids program in South Africa, Cape Town or Joburg? 
both Cape Town and Joburg, um, which was fantastic. Um, Kayode is at the back. Kayode, if you don't mind waving. Kayode is from Nigeria, and Kayode has been running um, a School of Open Nigeria program, um, teaching programming and a couple of other skills uh, to, is it university students? High school and university. Um, then we've got Arista Rick Maro from Tanzania. Is he here? No. Um, so before Arist Aristaric is, uh, is now the new affiliate in Tanzania, but before Aristaric, there is uh, Paul Kiwelo, who is now a judge, a high court judge in Tanzania, who ran a bunch of courses with high school students in uh, Tanzania as part of the School of Open Tanzania program. Um, and they're not the only ones. There are a bunch of people. Um, Ethiopia, which I think is the newest affiliate, um, they became affiliates this year, has expressed interest in running a School of Open program as their flagship sort of kickoff program. So the School of Open Africa program ran in 2014 with quite some great success. Um, there's one more project I have to mention. So Alex Gakuru, um, our regional coordinator, had been talking to UNESCO for quite some time um, around open education issues. And they were able to run a pro uh, to facilitate a program which translated to, resulted into four courses of the University of Nairobi being uh, hosted on uh, UNESCO's um, OER platform. And that's the first university anywhere, I think, in East Africa that has adopted, um, that has moved a lot of their courses into um, open, translated a lot of their courses into open educational resources. And they're publicly av available for free for anyone who wishes to download them. And for me, that's a good thing. Because a lot of people may, not, may never have the opportunity to go to the University of Nairobi. We graduate about 700,000 students each year. Only about 10,000 get into public universities. And so, the, increasingly, we've kept on thinking about the School of Open. For us in the region, um, and for me particularly, it's, there's a very close connection with meeting people face to face. And for a long time, I kept it to myself until I met Delia. Delia has been running, um, Delia also, I think, is on the board of uh, P2PU, and she's been running uh, the Copyright for Teachers in Australia program. And she's been doing it offline, and like most of our programs has been, have, have, has been having a 95% um, Sorry, for those people who complete the courses, um, it's 95% of them, and which is fantastic. And the engagement levels are pretty high. There's just all sorts of benefits in doing this program offline. And I know we're not the only ones. Um, there are a lot of people we've interacted with, both within the School of Open Community and outside, who've taken it upon themselves to literally translate the materials into a model that can be teachable offline to communities that don't necessarily have access to computers or mobile phones um, or fast bandwidth, uh, which is a very common problem um, in the African region. So this has been great. And we began talking amongst the communities. And in, in the mix of a lot of conversations, I got a, f um, a call from Jane Park, who until recently was leading the School of Open um, effort in, uh, globally from HQ. And the email basically said that, hey, Simeon, so we think you've been doing really awesome with the whole School of Open program, um, and we would love for you to take it and run it. Um, and at first, I wasn't too sure what to make of that email. Um, and as it, sit, as it sat in my head, I was like, yes, I am going to do this because of one simple reason. I think the future of the School of Open should be more offline. I think more and more people should have the opportunity to meet and to share the knowledge in person and to benefit from the in-person sort of connections that people make. I told somebody when we were coming that um, this global summit feels like a high school reunion because there's all these amazing people that you've worked with for the last two years and, and um, it's been hard to find time to meet up with them and we're finally here and you know everyone's giving each other hugs. It's a really good, there's a lot of value in being there together face to face. And this is what we want to translate offline. So 
And I'll give you an example of one of the things that, of two projects that are currently, one is currently ongoing and a second one will launch next, uh, next year in January. So P2PU has this project called the Learning Circles. Um, and what it is is basically um, study groups um, in partnerships with libraries. So people, if you have a course, you can organize on Peer-to-Peer -peer University or any course that's already up on there. And I encourage you, please check out the site, p2pu.org um, or schoolofopen.org. And pick the course, partner with one of your local institutions, um, one of the local libraries, and run a course for 90 minutes every week for about six weeks. Um, or, and I guess this logistics also depends on the different uh, circumstances, circumstances in the different regions. And just see how that goes. One of the things that we do know is that we expect um, a higher retention rate. So a lot of the courses, I've taught the Y Open course for two years in a row um, on, as part of the School of Open program. And usually the number of people who sign up are many. I remember the first time we launched the course in 2013. Um, we only wanted 50 people, um, 270 people um, applied. Um, and so at some point we decided, let's just let them all in. And on day one, we had 50 people. On the last day, we had five people. And I know this is a challenge that a lot of people who are running MOOCs or online um, education efforts are facing. Um, but for me, I think the solution is try and engage these people offline and build a local community um, that can do local things. So that's one, uh, the Learning Circles efforts. Um, and I'll tweet out the link um, with the hashtag School of Open um, and hashtag CC Summit 15, just for everyone else to have access to it. The second one is, uh, we'll launch in January, but I'll tell you what it is right now. A lot of people are not very sure about offline trainings. I've had this concern from a lot of people, from, from a lot of the community members um, in just doing our research and putting all this together. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to take one course and we're going to put it on P2PU and we're going to give a toolkit or a guide on how to basically run your own offline um, education initiative. And what we hope is that a lot of the global community can give us back their lessons and we can organize these lessons in a nice little toolkit that will help any other person who wishes to run these courses um, to em enable them to do this for themselves. I do know this is a tried and, and proven model. Let me go back to my story. So I made a promise to my girlfriend at the time and the promise when we were discussing about why she was feeling a bit edgy um, was because she had a burden for a lot of people who do not have access to the digital world. Um, or whose access may be limited or whose access may be threatened uh, for whatever reason. One of the things, I think the reason she said that is because right now in East, East Africa, the biggest topic is internet freedom. And um, last night I realized, no, let me not say that here. Um, and the promise I made to her was that we would move our entire effort from just running online programs or teaching people who had access. And we would do every single thing that we can to take all these opportunities to those people who are offline, who do not have the opportunity to learn or to access anything online. I am very proud to say that this is the first step that we are taking to, that I'm taking to fulfill this promise. But I'm starting to also realize this promise is not necessarily for just her, but it's for the countless of other people who the skills that they will learn, the, the skills that they will learn and the opportunities that will open up for them will hopefully create for them a pathway that will enable them to sustain themselves, to do something awesome. Um, and I believe everybody who creates anything is awesome. Um, and, and not only that, but also to grant other people through their interactions to grant other people a chance um, as well to find new opportunities, to learn new skills and to build each other. So my pitch is this, please join the School of Open program. Please help us take all the awesome things that you are doing. You don't have to do anything new. Just take, think about the 
all the awesome projects, one thing I like about the Global Summit is that it's a showcase. Um, I get to meet a lot of different people doing a lot of different and interesting things. But it is my hope that we will take everything that we're doing and translate it offline to all those people who are not able to access it and bring that generation of people on board um, and make this a more inclusive community. Uh, and I think having more people on board also gives us the opportunity or gives us the privilege to co-create better, to gain new perspectives, and to create a richer and a more diverse community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simeon. Uh, could I ask all the speakers to uh, just come up in the front? We've got a about three minutes where we can take questions from the audience. So anybody who is a speaker, please come up front. And audience, get your questions ready. Who's got a question? Hal. So everybody um, that I've met, and it's probably true of all of you that's working here, one thing we all need is more money and more resources to expand. So we know that. But do you have any ideas you can share with us or, or each other about ways you can make progress without money? Or ways that you can make progress that maybe lead to resources? What can we do to make something out of nothing? Um, let me tell you about something that we, we hope we're going to be able to implement this year in my, in my department, which is... Um, uh, so my department also includes the, um, the Arabic program, and all university students, even though it's an English language university, are required, even though they're native speakers of Arabic, to do um, one semester of advanced Arabic. It could be a literature course, it could be something else. Um, I've instructed the coordinator to develop material uh, to compile a kind of reader for the different types of uh, multi-section courses that we have in Arabic program. One of the things we hope to do, that I hope to do, after we get through the little steps that we discussed in the, in the presentation and after we have our, our, our website live, I mean, it's almost finished, but once it's live, is to be able to you know, um, place a license on that material and make it available to all instructors of Arabic um, in Lebanon in a country in which the teaching of Arabic is deemed very kind of outdated by students, um, material seems to be um, very classical in orientation, etc. And so that's, you know, moving to the production side as opposed to the receiving side of material is one small way that is, you know, marginally um, um, cost effective, if you will. So um, I'll just chip in. Um, how we run our programs has been quite a bit without funding, uh, most of them. And we partner with already established organizations, mostly high schools. Um, these high schools already have the resources that we would initially, without them, we would initially have to spend. So everything from sometimes bandwidth or the computers, um, sometimes it's just space. Um, and the students are already organized in either clubs or certain classes. That also makes it easier um, and reduces the overhead of having to, the overhead cost of you know, planning and logistics and programs like that. So our partnerships are very uh, strategic. Um, and, and they help us reduce cost, especially if those institutions have already met those costs as part of their existing process. Yeah, one thing, if you think about OER and making if you are OER bigger in, in one country, and uh, what I found very effective, uh, because I don't like those national programs, I like policy, but this is not the best way to make something very embedded into community because they can end, the money for national programs can end, the policy can change. So what I find very effective is that it doesn't need, you don't have to need money for that, is to find out who are the best influencers among teachers and among this community of teachers and educators. Uh, like I was talking shortly, briefly about this uh, super teachers group, like 150 people, it's not a big group, but all of them no Creative Commons, like half of them probably use Creative Commons quite effectively. But they have influenced a lot of different teachers because there are who are, are paid to run trainings. There are one who are, uh, publishers are ordering trainings from them. They are, they are used in ad advertisements for teachers. So if you find out who is in this group and you can influence them, you can work with them, which is basically personal work, 
and you can make trains for them and that you can they will change this is very cost effective because they can influence very fast a lot of other teachers and if their teachers will recognize OER then maybe those national projects will be more effective in, in future so you don't need money for that and this is very effective though it's very very hard work but without money uh, well um, I share the same idea I agree with you totally but one thing, you know, I'll, I'll be waiting to give you the, the correct answer. I will wait for uh, Paul's book to finish. You know, he's writing a book about, you know, all those models, you know, how to. So then, you know, maybe next year we'll, <laughs> we can. Right, Paul? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>